Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to the service of worship this morning, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching online, and uh, you're all welcome. You may also be watching at any time during the week or later on, so welcome to everyone to worship this morning. We also welcome back this week uh, the Reverend Martin Forrest, uh, who are delighted to have leading worship with us this morning. A couple of intimations. First of all, next Sunday afternoon, that's the 14th of August at 2 o'clock, uh, part of the Talents uh, show, we have a Classics and Coffee afternoon. So there's classical music, but there's also music that has stood the test of time. Uh, favourites. An afternoon of organ, violins and voice. That's next Sunday, 14th of August at 2 o'clock in the church and all proceeds will be to the Talents Fund. And secondly, a, a bit of sad news. People who went to um, the Holy Land or to Oberammergau, the trip to them, will remember Larry and Beth Sutherland from Shetland who went there. It's, it's my sad uh, duty to let you know that um, Beth passed away yesterday. So our thoughts are with Larry and the rest of the family. There's no details about funeral or anything like that yet, but our thoughts and prayers are with them at this time. Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you once again. These words are from Psalm 24 and Psalm 25. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all that live in it. So show us your ways, O Lord, and teach us to live according to your truth. So let's sing all people that on earth do dwell. It's hymn 63.
let's pray. Lord, this earth is yours and everything in it. We are yours and everything we have comes from you. Life and breath, health and strength, the gift of time and the company of others. So don't be far from us when trouble is near and there's no one to help. Give us the precious gift of your presence and give us the quietness of heart to feel your closeness and your peace. Forgive our sins and our foolishness and let us feel in Christ Jesus himself the warmth of your grace and the power of your love. Open our hearts and minds to the mercy you hope will replace our sorrow with gladness, to your compassion which never fails, to your presence which always brings great joy and deep contentment. And remind us daily of your promises, of love that will not let us go, of light that will guide our ways, of life that is rich in all its fullness, of peace beyond our understanding. God of music and song, God of color and beauty, hear these prayers through the Christ who revealed to us your goodness and compassion, and in whose words we pray together now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the glory forever. Amen. A couple of years ago now, well, maybe more than that, before lockdown anyway, my daughter and I went on a beekeeping course. I've no idea why we did this. We both live in flats. <laughs> we, we can't keep bees. We had no intention of keeping bees. But we did want to find out a wee bit about bees. And the course was fascinating. And I've actually been totally mesmerized by bees ever, ever since. They are the most amazing creatures, as I'm sure you know. Uh, I mean, we found out a bit about them in the, uh, in the, in the course. They, they, they live in, if they live in the wild, they live in colonies of a few hundred bees. If, they, if they're in hives, there can be anything between 10,000 and 60,000 bees in a hive. And they're highly organized. I mean, 60,000 of you in one house, you have to be quite organized, really. Uh, but they, they are very well organized. They've got very sophisticated means of communicating with each other. The phrase busy bee is absolutely accurate. The bees are very, very busy uh, working from uh, when they get up in the morning and when they go to sleep at night, just constantly working. Uh, the ones in the hive cleaning it out and keeping it all tidy and neat. And the female bees, all the bees you see flying about, collecting pollen and nectar, uh, they are uh, they're female bees. Uh, and they're the only ones that can sting, by the way. Uh, so they're all the ones out there. And they can travel about 16 miles an hour. Uh, I've, I've tried racing a bee in my bike, and I know that's true. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they can travel about five or six miles a day uh, collecting the nectar that they're going to make honey out of and, and the pollen as well. So they're, they're absolutely amazing, the, these creatures. But there's two facts that's, that, that stick out uh, for me uh, from, from, the, from the course, from what I learned about it. Uh, and one is that the bees are responsible for the pollination of something like 75% of the crops and plants, everything that grows on the planet. So they're absolutely essential. They are the ones who spread the pollen that keeps everything going, or the main ones. Other insects do this too, the wind does it as well, but the bees are the ones that are largely responsible for doing this. 
So apparently Albert Einstein said, if you want people to really take seriously what you're saying, say that Albert Einstein said it. I think I, I, think I even mentioned this last week, but I'm pretty, this is quoted so often, I'm pretty sure Einstein did, did say this. He said, if the bees disappeared, then we would starve within four years. The crops that we need to feed ourselves and our families would be gone in four years. If the bees go, we go. That's how important they are to us and, and the planet. Uh, and that's why it's quite disturbing that we're losing. Uh, bee numbers are falling. We've lost uh, two or three species of bees in the last few years, and, and bee numbers across the world are falling. And that's quite disturbing, and scientists are quite worried, worried about this. So they're absolutely essential to keeping everything going. But the other interesting thing I learned was that it takes 12 bees their entire lifetime to make one teaspoonful of honey. So every bee in its whole life only makes a twelfth of a teaspoonful of honey. Quite amazing. Not a great achievement, you would think. I don't think there's many proud, arrogant bees out there. <laughs> Most of these bees, if they think about this at all, probably don't think that they do very much. But what they do is absolutely essential, even though it's just a tiny contribution. And it just reminds me of what Jesus said uh, about us. You know, we may not think that we do much, that we contribute much. Sometimes we think, what am I really doing? Am I, uh, uh, am I contributing enough to the world and uh, to the community around about me? But Jesus said, look at the flowers. Look at the, the birds. God looks after them all, and God cares for you as well. He said, look at the sparrows. He might have said the bees. Sparrows are two a penny, but not one of them falls to the ground without your Father in heaven knowing about it. All these creatures, the sparrows, the birds, the plants, and the bees are really, really vital and important, even though many people think that they don't do much. And the bees themselves might not think that they're doing very much. So every tiny act of kindness or love or grace that we show matters. If a bee that collects a twelfth or a spoonful of honey in its whole lifetime matters, then how much more do our acts of kindness and love and grace matter? That's how we can learn a, a great lesson from the bees. So next time you're feeling a wee bit low and you're maybe thinking that uh, you're wondering what you're doing and you're not feeling great about yourself, go out and find a bush or some flowers where there's some bees. My wife and I did this the other day. We sat down we sat in a park beside a bed of flowers. They seem to like purple flowers best. We searched all these beds of flowers, the yellow ones we thought would be attractive to bees and things. It was the purple ones that they really go for. And there were dozens and dozens of bees over this bed of flowers. Just do that. Take time. Look at the bees. Look at what they're doing. You can get really close to bees. They don't, they're very unlikely to, to, to sting as long as you don't interfere with their, with the work that they're doing. Just watch them and absorb it and realize how important they are and how important you are as well. So there's only one hymn we can sing after thinking about the bees. Number 137, what is it? 137. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and very, 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 very small. <laughs> one three seven.
Two readings, the first from Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 to 22. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all round. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, upper, and middle decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. And then from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, from verses 43 to 48. Jesus is speaking here and he says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. God causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. And let's sing, I heard the voice of Jesus say, hymn 540.
believe it or not, there are over 16,000 different species of bees in the world. Some of the books say 20,000. There are 250 species of bumblebee alone, although I think in, in this country we only have 24. But according to a study by the University of Hawaii, there are 8.7 million different species of animals, birds, fish, and other insects on the planet. So that's a lot of animals to squeeze onto an ark that's only twice the size of the Waverley and just over half the length of the Titanic, which makes it seem unlikely that all the details that the Bible gives us about the story of Noah's ark are literally true. But that's not the point. And we miss the point of a beautiful ancient story like this if we just ask our typical modern scientific questions like, how was all this possible? And did this really happen? Or did it happen the way the Bible says? Whether it did or not, the story is important. And it's obviously made a big impression on the collective memory of the human race. Noah also appears in the Quran. Stories about a great flood pop up in various Hindu stories and some ancient Greek myths and in an old Babylonian story called the, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Noah's mentioned quite a few times in the rest of the Old Testament and in the New Testament and by Jesus himself. So there must, there must be a reason for this. It has to be more than just a fun story about animals that we can tell to our children. So what are we meant to take from it? What's the point of this story? Well, it seems to me that at one level at least, the lesson is the same as the message of Jesus that we heard in our second reading this morning. It's telling us who to love and how to love and what to love. But first, let's get one misunderstanding out of the way. It would appear that there was, at some point long ago, some kind of cataclysmic flood in the area around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And if that happened, it's natural that people looked for an explanation, not just for why the flood took place, but also for any kind of human survival afterwards. And for ancient peoples, there was really only one explanation for a disaster of this kind. God. And if God did it, then it must have been because God was angry. Ancient peoples had no other possible explanation for such a catastrophe. So what we have in Noah's Ark is a story that is explained by telling us that God was angry because people all over the world were living evil lives and the earth was full of violence. But this simple explanation doesn't give us a very encouraging image of God, and it doesn't come from a very sophisticated faith. This is not the wise, mature faith of the prophets who spoke about God's compassion and mercy and love and forgiveness. And this is not the faith of Jesus and the other New Testament writers who taught us that God is love and told us not to be afraid of God. And it's important for us to listen to these later wiser voices, because if we remain with this old misunderstanding of God, then our whole relationship with God would still be based on fear, and we'd still be thinking that every natural disaster that happens, every earthquake, every famine, every virus that appears is a sign of God's anger. And that would be wrong. Only insurance companies still talk about calamities like this as acts of God. But in the church, surely, 
our image of God is now more positive and more mature. And yet, still, there is something of truth that remains in this ancient explanation of the flood. And that is that we as a human race are still making a right mess of the way we live on this earth. And God's hatred of evil and violence remains. God wants us to live in peace and love and care for one another and for all the creatures of this earth like Noah did. And that message we are first taught in this story. And we should, we should never forget it, especially in a world that's still seriously damaged by human carelessness and violence. It's important to note, too, that in this story, God goes to the same trouble to save the animals as He does to save Noah and his family. God cares for all the creatures of this earth, every living thing. And you don't need me to tell you this, but the way we are living on this planet is endangering the animals that this story tells us Noah saved. And as we all know from the news almost every day now, our way of life is endangering the earth itself. So the first lesson we get from the story of Noah's ark is about our responsibility to every creature on the, this earth, from the bees to the bears, from the hens to the hamsters. And it's about our responsibility for the planet and the habitat, which is their home and ours. And the more we learn through people like David Attenborough about bees and their role in maintaining life on the planet and about every other amazing creature on the earth, the more we realize that God went to the same enormous trouble to create them as He did to create us, which is why a story about Noah saving the animals as well as his own family is so important. But the story of Noah and his ark goes further than this. We still live in a very violent world, as I said, and as the invasion of Ukraine has reminded us. And we're still as prone to worldwide disasters like COVID as the world ever was. As well as that, we all have our own personal troubles our own worries, and our own fears. And the message of Noah's Ark is that through every disaster and potential catastrophe, and in the midst of all our own fears and anxieties, God really does care about us as He did for Noah. And God didn't just care about Noah because He was a good man. Although it says at the beginning of the story that Noah had no faults, read on and you'll find that this is not the whole story. In the next chapter, Noah becomes the first recorded human being to discover, through personal experience, the effects of alcohol. And there he is, lying blind drunk and completely naked in his tent, and this is all sorts of painful consequences for Noah and his family. But despite this, despite not being consistently a good man, this story is still about God's love for Noah and for us. And the story underlines this point by ending with an enduring reminder of its central message. A rainbow appears in the sky after the flood, and the story interprets this rainbow as a sign of God's promise, a symbol of the love that God has for all the people and all the creatures God has made. Of course, we now know the scientific explanation for a rainbow. We know that it's now caused by, I looked this up, it's caused by the reflection, the refraction, and dispersion of lights of, drop, of light in drops of water, resulting in a spectrum of light in the sky. 
But the book of Genesis provides an explanation for the rainbow that is far more beautiful and far more powerful than that. And to be honest, if anyone looks at a rainbow and only sees an interesting meteorological phenomenon, then I think there's something missing in your soul. A rainbow is a work of art, a work of God's art. The rainbow is a sign of God's love, not just for some people and not just for human beings, but for the animals too, because God says it is a promise I am making to all living creatures. So when Jesus teaches us to love one another, he's taking us right back to the message of Noah's story. And when Jesus teaches us not just to love one another and not just to love those who love us, but to love our neighbors, all of them, and to love our enemies as well, he is pointing to every rainbow we have ever seen and ever will see. And he is reminding us that our love is not God's love until it is love for all that God has created, the earth and all its creatures, the world, and all its people. And maybe this is the main task that God is calling us all to in the world as it is today. So many of our problems have reached crisis levels because we have not yet learned to love as deeply or as widely as Jesus teaches us. We love our people more than others. We love our part of the planet more than we care about other parts of the planet. We love our way of life more than the earth itself. So maybe God is asking us to do more today than come to church or to keep our churches going or to do all the many other things we've always associated with being faithful Christians. Maybe God is calling people like us, people who have time for God, people like us who make room in our hearts and minds for God. Maybe God is calling us not just to do more, but to be be more thoughtful and more reflective about how all of us are living our lives. And one way we might be more reflective is by building our own ark, by creating a a place and a time in our day when we feel safe and secure and can't be touched or disturbed or affected in any way by what's going on uh, uh, or by other people. And I don't just mean we should pray more. I mean finding a time and place where we can regularly stop and be still and quieten our souls and feel at peace, allowing God to lift us up like the flood waters lifted Noah's ark. I'm talking about letting the love God has for us sink more deeply into our hearts and souls, remembering what Jesus said to us about the birds and the flowers and the sparrows. And in time and with practice, and I'm talking to myself here too, I think we'll find that a greater, more reflective personal appreciation of the love God has for us will lead us beyond our normal circle of care to a deeper understanding of the love God has for the whole earth, for all the creatures, and for all people without exception or any exclusions at all. What God and the world need from Christians now are people who are more broad-minded and more open-hearted and more deeply and genuinely loving than we have ever been. And we will get this from remembering Noah and his ark, from paying more attention to the sparrows, uh, from appreciating the bees, and from listening carefully to what Jesus has said to us. And we'll get this from a deeper contemplation and a more grateful appreciation of how much we ourselves are loved. Amen.
and let's sing of the love that will not let us go. It's hymn 557. <coughs> once more. O oh, love that will not let us go, today we rest our weary souls in you. In our offerings and in our prayers, we give you back the lives we owe, that in the depths of your love the flow of our lives might be richer and fuller. You are the joy that seeks us through our pain, and we cannot close our hearts to you. So we trace the rainbow through the rain and feel your promise is not vain, that tomorrow will be a tearless, better day. God of love, God of grace, let us build in our hearts and souls an ark, a place and time in our lives where we can feel safe in your presence and allow your love to reach through our distractions and worries, through our fears and self-doubts, and touch our souls in our inmost being, where we can feel the peace we so long for. Lord, this week might bring some hard task to our lives, or some hard trial to our love. We might grow weary or sad or anxious about how things unfold. But in our lives so far, you have given many signs of your love. You've given us all we need. You have put love in our hearts. You've given strength to our spirits. 
So help us as we stand on this side of all this week might bring to resolve that we will trust you, trust you to shine your light into any gloom in our minds, to stand by us in any trials we might face, and to give us rest when we need it. May this week be full of a grace that brings us closer to you and a faith that you will look after us and all those we love and care about. Let us trust in you to look after us all, and especially the most vulnerable among us, as our planet struggles to keep its balance, as our politics shakes our confidence, and the predictions make us nervous. Lord, this is a crazy, mixed-up world we live in, but it's still your world, and even your weakness is greater than all human power. And the teaching we cling to, which the world so often sees as foolish, is, we know, wiser than all human wisdom. So let us not give up today or ever on the love, joy, and peace, on the patience, kindness, and generosity, on the faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against which there is no law, but which we see unfailingly in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name, as always, we pray. Amen. And let's close our worship by singing, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, hymn 519.
the love of God's gracious Christ and the presence of God's gracious Spirit be with you all and be God's blessing to you now and always.